Hello and welcome back. Today's lecture is on the age of exploration. We're going to cover three main topics, European transformation, Columbus risk and innovation, and the Spanish model. The age of exploration, also known as the age of discovery, runs from about 1350 to 1600 ACE. During this time period, exploration of the African coast, new routes to Asia, and the discovery of the Americas all occurred. This era is an important transition to the modern world and a global society. This image is a painting from the time period. It is called The Merchants and shows the increasing power and importance of this economic and social class. The painting gives us a picture of people who are wealthy and self-assured. In addition, these people were interested in technology and artistic innovations. Aside from the merchants themselves, we see the things that they collected. Musical instruments, books, globes, among other things. While we often hear about kings and queens sponsoring exploration, we seldom recognize the importance of merchants. These individuals loan money to emperors and in turn often influence their actions and those of explorers. A key thing to keep in mind is that wealth was the driving force behind exploration. Royal governments sought to enrich themselves, but they also had to pay back their loans. Okay, let's get started. To understand the age of exploration, we should consider several important changes in Europe. The first thing to look at is important technological innovations in travel, farming, and weapons. Let's begin with travel. In this image, we have a picture of the caravel. This was originally a Portuguese design that was quickly copied and improved on by the Dutch and the English. This was a stout ship, meaning that it was relatively short and tubby. That it was relatively small allowed it to travel deep upriver to pick up and deliver cargo. That it was relatively tubby made it seaworthy, meaning that it was stable in the open sea. These factors gave the ship tremendous flexibility. Using rivers, it could take on and deliver cargo deep inland. Since it was seaworthy, it did not need to transfer its cargo to other ships, but it could just continue onto the sea. In addition to its size, the caravel had the most advanced sail technology. The sails turned sharply, which allowed it to catch the wind from many angles. And again, since the ship was relatively small, it needed relatively little wind for propulsion. Regarding farming, new steel tip plows allowed farmers to turn the soil over more effectively. The steel tip dug deeper into the soil, thus exposing more minerals. And since the tip was much harder, it was less likely to break. There were also a lot of innovations in weapons. With improvements in metal, traditional weapons like swords and shields became lighter and at the same time more deadly. The discovery of gunpowder led to the development of handguns as well as cannon. Incidentally, what we call gunpowder came from China. It was used for fireworks, but Europeans found a way to weaponize it, giving them an edge on their enemies. Improved weapons were added to traditional ones like attack dogs and armored horses. Technological innovations gave Europeans advantages against their enemies but other changes push Europeans abroad. Let's turn to these now. From 1100 to 1400 ACE, population grew sharply. One reason was that the improvement in farm technology provided a bigger food supply. But perhaps more importantly, society had built up immunities from the plagues that had ravaged Europe for centuries. The negative side of population growth is that it put more pressure on the land, leading to increased tensions between neighboring kingdoms. Another side effect of population growth was that kings had more people they could coerce into their armies. This created a destructive mutually supporting cycle. More people created more tension, leading to war. But having access to more people, royal governments could build bigger armies. Population pressures also led Europeans to colonize other territories. The most intense colonization occurred after the discovery of the New World. We will get to that a little bit later in the class. 
For now, I would like to show how population growth intensified religious and political competition in Europe. The first thing to address is the growing power of merchants. As noted at the beginning of the lecture, these individuals loan money to royal governments. As tensions increased among kingdoms, royalty took on more debt. This gave a lot of power to merchants. Aside from interest on loans, financiers often negotiated special privileges from kings and queens. The result was that they gained a level of independence from royal authority. While merchants were gaining new independence, kingdoms like Spain, France, England, and the Italian states were trying to claim more territory and centralize their authority. Conversely, small kingdoms, often referred to as the German states, sought ways to fight against the growing power of bigger states like France and Spain. Adding to the tension was an intensification of conflict within Christianity. Up to about 1400 ACE, the Catholic Church dominated religious life in Europe. It also tried to regain territory in the Holy Land from Muslims. These are the areas that today we call Israel, Lebanon, and Palestine. These wars are referred to as the Crusades. But after 1400 ACE, religious war turned inward. A religious movement as the Reformation mixed in with royal competition for land. Kingdoms, mostly in Northern Europe, allied themselves with various Protestant groups who led the Reformation. France, Italy, and Spain allied themselves with the Catholic Church. The result was warfare over land, money, and God. The story of Christopher Columbus needs to be told within the context of intensifying economic competition and religious conflict in Europe. Let's now turn to how Columbus fit into this picture. In an earlier lecture, I mentioned that the term pre-Columbian refers to societies of the Americas before the arrival of Columbus. In this sense, Columbus represents a dividing line. There is the world before and after Columbus. Discovery of the Americas is part of an epic change, but there are also many other changes. One of them is the way people conceptualize the world. These maps offer a picture of old concepts. These are referred to as T.O. maps. They are conceptual maps of the globe. The name comes from the general design of the map. We see a T and an O. The T divides the three known parts of the globe. Asia is at the top, which represented the East. The Latin word for East is Orient. So when Europeans referred to people as Orientals, they were saying Easterners. Europe is on the left which represents the north, and Africa is on the right, which represents the south. The O is the ocean that surrounds all of the land. In this T-O map, we see Christ at the top. This is important because T-O maps place Asia in the far east, but also place paradise on the other side of China. Returning to the idea that Columbus can be seen as a dividing line, one of the changes occurring during the Age of Exploration was that of maps. T.O. maps were meant to give people a mental picture of the globe as part of God's creation. Maps were not used as navigation devices. Travelers navigated by landmarks. But in the Age of Exploration, maps were transformed. People began to try and outline land masses. Which brings us to the map that Columbus used to argue that he could travel to China by sailing west. This is a replica of the map Columbus used to get his funding from the King and Queen of Spain. It is an example of geographic maps that were new at that time. These maps broke with conceptual understandings of the globe. They sought to depict how land masses related to each other and how they fit into lines of longitude and latitude. Lines of longitude divide the earth into even sections of the globe in an east-west manner. You can see them here. Lines of latitude divide the earth in a north-south manner. We can see them here. This land mass is Cathay, what we call China. This is Chipango, modern-day Japan. 
and this collection of islands was referred to as India. Today we call these islands Indonesia. This section of the map was made from detailed notes of explorers who had traveled overland to Asia. They gave Columbus geographic information and also demographic information. Demographics refers to data such as population concentrations, languages, and political structures. This section outlines Europe and the northern coast of Africa. In it, we see islands in the Atlantic, such as the Azores, Canary, and Madeira. These islands are far out in the Atlantic, the Azores being about 1,100 miles west of Europe. In Columbus's plan, he was going to use these islands as stepping stones to Asia. This map is relatively accurate in many ways, but there are also some really big errors. The one that people of Columbus's time criticized was distance. In this map, the circumference of the globe is about 15,000 miles around. But going back to the time of the Greeks, the globe had been calculated to be about 26,000 miles in circumference. The Greeks were pretty close. Today, we calculate the distance to be about 25,000 miles around. By the way, seafaring people had known the world was round for centuries. Knowledgeable people did not worry about Columbus falling off the edge of the earth. They argued that the technology of the time would not allow sailors to make it from Europe to Asia because of distance. This brings us to the second big error, as well as irony. The big error is that the map does not show the Americas. This is because Europeans did not know it existed. The irony is that the Americas sit almost exactly where the map places Asia. So when Columbus arrived in Española, the island where modern-day Haiti and Dominican Republic sit, he felt vindicated. According to his map, he was in Asia. When he read the demographic notes about population centers, he knew he did not get to China or Japan. But the description of the islands and the people corresponded with what his map called India. Thus, he called the people he met Indians. Going beyond errors and irony, Let's take a look at important actions Columbus took. It is easy to criticize Columbus for his errors, and modern society has a healthy dialogue that seeks to reassess Columbus's position in history. Some ask whether he was a hero or a villain. Others argue that he committed genocide. We will discuss these topics in class, but for right now, let's take a look at historical information that is not in question. This map depicts the trade winds and currents of the Atlantic. The winds that flow from the African coast westward were well known, as were the winds flowing south along Europe. But society did not know that these winds were all part of a cycle. This takes us to Columbus's key contribution to the knowledge of the time. He was a skilled navigator. After landing in what today is the Caribbean, he had to find a way back to Europe he ended up finding the westerly wind currents that took him back to Europe. There was a lot of luck in this discovery, but aside from luck, Columbus documented his actions. He mapped the area as well as he could. He took notes on land masses, concentration of populations, as well as wind and sea currents. With this information, he was able to repeat his trip. He came to the New World four times. But the information did not stay with Columbus. His notes and maps were used by others, who explored more fully, each time getting more detailed information about the Americas. Let's now turn and see how Columbus's actions began the transformation of the Americas, Europe, and Africa. To understand global transformation that developed with European discovery of the Americas, we need to take a look at the collected actions of Europeans. A number of individuals are important historical actors, but more important are the models or systems that were put in place. Let's take a look at some of the historical actors that helped put in place the Spanish model. Columbus is one of these actors, but now I'd like to turn to Américo Vespucci. The name of the continents of the Western Hemisphere are derived from him. To understand the naming of America, we should start with the political concept known as the rights of discovery. In the laws of Europe, 
This meant that ownership over land was given to the first civilized people who mapped land and registered its claim with other civilized people. This brings us to the image on the screen. Amerigo Vespucci is the man on the left. Notice that he is fully clothed, has a flag with ships in the background. Now take a look at the woman in the hammock. She's naked. This image was on the opening pages of a book written by Vespucci where he argued that Columbus did not find a route to Asia. Instead, Vespucci argued that Columbus had discovered an unknown world. Since this was a new world and that people were uncivilized, then the rights of discovery were at play. As presented by Vespucci and accepted by Europeans, people of the Americas were uncivilized. This is because as far as Europeans were concerned, the people had false religions or no religion at all. They were savage. One way this was measured was by clothing or lack of it. Savagery was also judged by practices of sacrifice, whether human or animal. The rights of discovery are important because it set off an intense competition among Europeans to send explorers to the New World so they could map and register their claims and in turn claim ownership over the land. This map provides a brief outline of some of the early missions to the New World. We see that many governments sponsored exploration. Most explorations were sponsored by Spain, with a concentration in the Caribbean, Mesoamerica, the south of what would become the US, and South America. Here we see that Vespucci explored the coast of South America. The huge landmass he followed did not correspond to anything in Asia. This is why he challenged Columbus's argument. Where the rights of discovery are important in understanding why European kingdoms rushed to explore the New World, the discovery made by Cortes in Mesoamerica helps explain European actions once they arrived. On the map, we see that in 1519, he entered a city in Mesoamerica known as Tenochtitlan. This city was built very close to the ancient city Teotihuacan that had built the Pyramids of the Sun and Moon. That city had disappeared about 600 A.C.E. Tenochtitlan was the capital of the Aztec Empire. It was a thriving city of about 200,000 people when Cortes arrived and controlled an empire of perhaps one million people. Based on his discovery, Cortes set up the Spanish model that helped transform the Americas, but also Africa and Europe. Let's turn to that now. Cortes's discovery was very different than other explorers. Columbus and others encountered native people, but their communities were relatively small. Most were fishing societies. Conversely, the Aztec Empire was at the heart of the farming region. And as noted in our earlier lectures, farming societies had the resources to build big cities. In addition to farming, the Aztecs were in an area rich in mineral resources. Unlike other Europeans, Cortes encountered a capital city with vast human and material wealth. The conquest of the Aztec is an interesting story, but we do not have the time to review it here. The key thing I'd like us to keep in mind is that Cortes did not seek to destroy the wealth he discovered. Instead, he sought to take it over and direct the wealth toward the king and queen of Spain. Cortes saw that the Aztecs had access to resources of wealth that included arable land, mineral resources, especially precious metals, and big populations that could be used for labor. In addition, the Aztec had a productive system of plantations, as well as a complex system of trade and taxation. Cortes successfully removed the Aztec ruler and directed trade and taxation towards the Spanish crown. This model was so successful that other Europeans tried to replicate it in areas that they explored. The Spanish model was amazingly successful, but also very destructive. This image will help explain this point. In it, we see how labor was used by the Spanish. Incidentally, this photo comes from Brazil in the 1980s, just 30 years ago. Nevertheless, it is very close to how the Spanish described their use of labor. These people are working in an open pit gold mine. The gold is laced in clay. To extract it, 
Workers soften the clay with water, pack it in bags, and haul it up rickety ladders. This is a close-up of workers going up the ladders. Imagine what would happen if workers towards the top slipped and fell. They would kill everyone below. In fact, these types of injuries occurred regularly. Again, the Spanish wrote about all this in the logs that they kept. Workers on plantations were treated in similar ways. The result was that when the Spanish took over the plantations and mines of the Aztec, their disregard for laborers led to sharp increases in the death rate of indigenous people. The products of the Americas were often produced in a brutal manner, but their export transformed Europe. Let's now look at the exchange of goods and people. Continental exchange refers to the products, animals, and humans that were exchanged between continents. As a note, the map is a little misleading. It makes it look like precious metals and various crops came from North America. Early on, the exchange was from the Caribbean and Mesoamerica to Europe. Still, if we follow the yellow stream, we see that gold and silver, among other precious metals, flowed to Europe. These resources expanded the money supply of Europe. We also see that crops like corn, potatoes, tomatoes, and chocolate were exported. These goods changed the food supply of Europe. If we follow the green streams, we see that Europe sent domesticated animals like cows, pigs, and horses to the New World. These resources transformed food supplies and transportation of the New World. We also see that European diseases were exported. Native people did not have immunities to these diseases. If we combine the impact of these diseases with work on plantations and mines, we see a devastating effect on populations of native people. Recent estimates argue that Mesoamerica and North America combined had a population of between 50 and 100 million people in 1500 ACE. But as a result of the interaction with Europeans, their populations dropped to perhaps 5 to 10 million people by 1600 ACE. Some people have called this the biggest genocide in human history. This brings us to this stream, slaves. The drop in population among native people pushed Europeans to make a choice. They could either stop producing goods on plantations, change the way people were treated on plantations, or get a new labor force. Their choice was to maintain profits, continue their labor practices, and find a new source of labor. The new labor force were slaves from Africa. The Spanish set up this model, and since so much wealth was produced, other Europeans would try and replicate it whenever they could. We'll discuss how the English adjusted the Spanish model in future lectures, but for now, we will close our lecture here. Okay, we'll see you in class.